Amish, are, 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 are our hospitals going to get back to normal? Or does the linkage of virus and bacteria mean our hospitals are forever changed? Hospitals are probably forever changed because of COVID-19. We've not seen an infectious disease outbreak really impinge hospital capacity for this long, probably since, since 1918. And now hospitals have really reconfigured themselves to be able to deal with COVID plus. So COVID plus heart attacks, COVID plus strokes, COVID plus all the other bacterial infections that we see. So there has been really a reconfiguration of how hospitals are. Everything from personal protective equipment to visiting hours, all of that has been changed. And hospitals are now just much more attuned to the threat of infectious diseases because in the past they never really cared so much about them because it was kind of an afterthought. They were really interested yeah. in lucrative surgeries, and now they realize that, that they have to be resilient to infectious diseases. I mean, microbiology 101 on this is staphylococcus and the worry about, you know, antibiotics and, you know, losing the value of antibiotics. How does that change within and after a viral pandemic? Well, what, we, what we've seen is that there is still a lot of inappropriate antibiotic use for COVID-19. So somebody might come into the hospital and have pneumonia from COVID-19. They often get antibiotics started, even though they're not necessary. So we have seen increases in resistance amongst people with COVID-19 in terms of the bacteria that live in their lungs, live on their body, because people are inappropriately prescribing antibiotics. So when you look at the long-term public health infectious disease threats, antibiotic resistance is probably the biggest one that we face because it threatens to pull us to a pre-penicillin era. And I think that's something that's really important that we, that we, we not take, the, take our eye off of the long game in infectious disease. And there, I think bacterial resistance has to be considered probably the, the top priority. If there is another pandemic, which a lot of people expect there to be, and I know that you particularly focus on plague and Ebola and all these other issues that are percolating around the world, are hospitals prepared for that now based on the COVID run we've just had? They're better prepared than they were in the past, but I think this really showed how unprepared they are in general. When you look at hospital preparedness, it's something that's often an afterthought, something that they do to check a box so that they meet their CMS requirement or the Joint Commission requirement. And they often focus on mass casualty accidents like a, a shooting or, or a, a fire or something like that, not so much on pandemics, not so much on things that are a sustained surge, a sustained change in the way they operate. And that, I think, has to change. You have to have the C-suite executives talking to the emergency managers. It shouldn't be some kind of afterthought that that they're that they kind of ba basically have no communication this has to be integrated into hospital operations if we're going to be prepared even for a, for a severe flu season in the future meanwhile at the state of play right now a lot of people are discounting covid in terms of the ongoing backdrop it will fade people are counting on that however it still is used as an explanation for some of the labor market frictions that we've seen people saying long covid perhaps or fear of covid is people keeping people out of the labor market what's been your experience with the various side effects of covid and how that sort of impinges on people's ability to work there is definitely a, sm a small subset of people who have a case of COVID and haven't quite got back to their baseline. I'm, I'm kind of excluding the people that were in the ICU because those people are going to have post-ICU syndrome and it's going to take them some time to get to their baseline. But there is some group that had mild infection that can't get back to it. We don't quite know a lot about this other than it happens in older people. It happens more likely to happen in females, people with other comorbid conditions. But we have bad definitions. We don't know exactly what fits into that criteria because some people may not have gotten their taste and smell back, whereas other people can't walk up the stairs now. So we've got to do a lot of science to try and pare this down to actually know what's going on, to be able to define it and study it and come up with treatments. And there are some people coming up with treatments, but it's going to be some time before we get our hands all around long COVID and how likely it is to occur and what treatments may work. Let's get back to the mundane, Dr. Adalja. Very simply, where are we on masks? Well, we know now during this pandemic that we that masks do work, that they, they do play a major role, especially when you're talking about an unvaccinated population. Uh, to me, I think mask wearing for the, for the vaccinated has very marginal benefits, maybe for some people who are very risk averse, but for the unvaccinated, they clearly work. And they also work for other respiratory viruses other than COVID-19. That's why people didn't have that many common colds or didn't have influenza. So we may see that become part of the culture, not because there's a government recommendation or mandate, but because people say, I'm on a subway or I'm in a crowded congregated place. This is something that I think we can um, use to blunt and to blunt any other respiratory viruses that we may, we may encounter.